All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to another edition of The Less Stressed Life, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about adrenal fatigue so that they can get their health back quickly. I'm joined here with my co-host, Becky Rue, who is a moderator and administrator and creator of the G6PD Deficiency Support Group on Facebook, who suffered with G6PD herself, and now she is developing protocols and research-based information to educate those that need the support. And she's here to co-host with a real special privileged guest that we have with us today. We've interviewed Bob several times, but Bob is the leading edge of healthcare and the way it's practiced uh, in the year 2021. He is a traditional naturopath. He specializes in genetic specific nutrition. He opened his tree of life practice and has served as a traditional naturopath for 25 years. And for the past uh, several years, he's been engaged exclusively in nutri nutritional genetic variations and related research, specializing in nutritional support for those with chronic Lyme. And I think that needs obviously to be updated because he specializes in people that just are having huge, huge health challenges. And the research that he's doing is going to enlighten the listener for today's topic on G6PD. So Bob, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you being here today. Oh, it's an honor. Always a privilege to be with you, Dr. Rosen. I, and I appreciate all the work you did to, uh, to help understand people, their adrenal fatigue and so many things. I know you're reaching out to a lot of folks and doing a lot of good work. So congratulations on all you do as well. Oh, well, thank you so much. And it's all because of the information that I listen to over and over again about what you're teaching. And I think the listeners are going to get such an amazing uh, piece of the puzzle that they're not getting because G6PD issues are looked at, as you explain, in a way where it's a genetic thing. Hey, do you have the gene? If you do, then oops, you're in trouble. And that's it. That's all. Versus there is a functional genomic nutrition approach and that's really what we're going to get into today. So how do you want to begin with this? Okay. Well, uh, firstly, maybe we ought to do just a little bit of genomic 101, because some of the people may not understand what we're going to be talking about. We'll do this very briefly. Uh, firstly, you know, what a miracle we are. We eat fats, carbohydrates, proteins. We drink water, breathe air, and expose the sunlight, and everything gets made. I mean, every time I say that, I sit back and I think, Wow, <laughs> that's, that's astonishing. And, and the reason that happens is because enzymes take one substance, combine it with something else and make something new. Then another enzyme comes along, combines that with something, makes something new. And that just goes on and on and on. Uh, your DNA is the instructions on how to make the enzymes. So when you hear about the word mutation or SNP or defect or whatever term you want to do, I like to just say major and minor because I don't like to say anything is defective. <clears throat> when you have that minor allele, that enzyme production may not be as robust as it should be. So therefore, that production of one substance to another just may not be as good as it should be. And what we look at from a functional genomic standpoint is how this can be affecting function. You know, I am not been trained or neither am I a geneticist. I mean, geneticists look at you know, genes that relates to disease. We just look at genetics how it has, has the potential, and let me say key word, potential, uh, to impact function. Uh, because just because you have a mutation, that doesn't mean for sure something's happening. But I, I like to train doctors and say, when you see mutations, it's something like waving at you, like think about looking here. So what we do at functional genomic analysis is, again, we don't look at disease states. We don't look at if you're going to get a disease. We look at, might you be making a little too many free radicals? May you not be making enough antioxidants? Might some of your detox pathways be less than robust as they should be? Uh, are some of your nutrient transports not as robust? And then there's a couple of things you can do. If you're not making enough of something, well, you can give someone that. If the enzymes maybe not at full force, there's nutrients that actually support an enzyme along. And if it's detox, uh, there's ways to support the the clearing of the toxins. All goes back to that traditional naturopathic philosophy, the one from a long time ago, that it's the terrain. And, uh, you know, Antoine Bachamp was the guy who said to Louis Pasteur, yeah, there's germs, but I think it's the environment that allows the germ to thrive. So Louis Pasteur was the let's kill the germ. Antoine Bachamp said, let's change the environment that allows the germ to live there. So 
that's the two sides. And of course, you know, they both argued, I guess, but the bottom line is they were both correct. We don't argue. We don't need to argue who's correct. Everybody is. So we need to clean up the terrain. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm 66 and I'm living in a world that I wasn't born into. Uh, when I was a kid, we didn't have growth hormones given to the animals. We had glass, not plastic. Uh, glyphosate wasn't around yet. Cell phones wasn't around yet. Uh, genetically modified foods wasn't around yet. So I believe what we're doing uh, is we are just creating a very toxic environment that we're living in. And all of us are being impacted. But for those who have a little bit of genetic weakness in their ability to create antioxidants or detox pathways, they're the proverbial canary in the mine that are being hurt the most. So many of these mutations that we have, I often believe that um, I see people that they're really sick and I think, gee, I wonder if they would have been born 50 years ago. They might not even have a problem. So, you know, that old adage that uh, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. And I, and I think we've, uh, we're going to look back someday with a lot of oopses on a lot of things that we've done. Uh, same like we look back on asbestos. You know, we all meant well. Hey, houses won't burn down. People won't die of a fire. Oops. You know, oh, let's put some lead in the gas. It doesn't knock as bad. Oops. Let's put some lead in the paint that makes the paint more effective. Oops. And I think we're going to continue to have many, many more of those as, uh, as time goes on. And those who have genetic weakness, uh, as I said, are the proverbial canary in the mines. So that's the background of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. That, so but when you say the word potential, though, it, it really minimizes what actually is going on, Bob, because you mentioned like you're fascinated by the fact that we can take food and different kinds of foods and create reactions and do so many things. And so I think we need to explain the fact that it's not just the potential that this gene makes this enzyme that does this function but it's also knowing how it plays nice with the environment and what nutrients are needed to be able to make it work properly and what things can slow it down. And not only that, but then what's above it, what's below it, what's 3D, what's diagonal and understanding all those relationships. So then when you do use the word potential and you are implementing a customized recovery strategy, those potentials add up to have effective results because you're catalyzing or it's that enzymatic reaction of one plus one plus one equals 12 or 15 or 20 in your outcomes for sure. So why don't we go down that rabbit hole as it relates to what uses up NADPH and, and how does that get re-stimulated um, re almost like a forward feeling, uh, forward um, feeding mechanism where it just, it's, it's in a vicious cycle of just going over and over again and how that relates to a G6PD person that would be even concerned about that. Sure. Well, let's first talk about NADPH. And as you know, I've been uh, intrigued by NADPH for years. Um, you know, you've got your NAD, your NAD+, your NADPH. Uh, there's, there's several of them. And uh, by the way, if anyone's a uh, health professional listening to this, um, we do have an online certification course where we have a whole module on, uh, on NAD, NADPH, and we show that. But we'll just cut right to the chase. I'm sure many people have heard, uh, you know, talks about the importance of NAD. So uh, if you start studying NAD, you'll learn how important this is. Because firstly, it uh, goes down to, uh, uh, goes up to NADH, which is at the top of the respiratory training, the electron transport for energy. Uh, then NAD also supports the PARP enzymes, which is your DNA repair. So when your cells get damaged, uh, the PARP enzymes need NAD to repair your cells when they're damaged. Uh, then NAD also feeds what are called the sirtuins, uh, which are responsible, they're part of your anti-aging, and they're responsible for making your SOD and your catalase. Uh, interestingly, there's a process called mTOR, which is the growth of new cells, autophagy, the cleaning of the cells, and interestingly, NAD stimulates some of the sirtuins that slows down mTOR and speeds up autophagy, mTOR being the growth of new cells. And of course, if we didn't have that, the sperm and the egg would never become the baby, the baby never become the adult. But if that mTOR is running too fast, that can lead to, uh, to inflammation. 
quick side note, um, COVID-19 uses mTOR for replication. So it's important we have this balance between uh, mTOR and autophagy. But then that NAD also becomes NADPH. And that's where I'm very intrigued. And there's a lot of genes that are involved that make the enzymes that turn to firstly make NAD. Then there's enzymes that turn uh, NAD into NADH for energy. And there's other genes that turn NAD into NADPH. So let's now focus on uh, NADPH. Uh, it does a lot. Okay. One of the major things we're going to talk about is how it's involved in uh, your detoxification of not only free radicals, but all the poisons inside the body. So if I can, uh, can I do a screen share here? Uh, yes, apps, please do. Yep. All right. Let me do a screen share. That old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words here. So, so the, uh, again, let's go back to the naturopathic philosophy. What breaks us down is inflammation. Now, just in case anybody needs to know, everything's made out of atoms. So you got the neutron, proton, and the electron that spins. And that needs to be electrically balanced. A free radical is when one of those electrons gets ripped off. Antioxidants have a spare electron. Antioxidants neutralize free radicals. Fairly simple. So glutathione is one of our most important antioxidants. Uh, it's called glutathione uh, or reduced glutathione when it's ready to go. Interestingly, it's made from cysteine glycine and glutamate. These three things go together. These little purple ovals here are enzymes. So these enzymes take the cysteine, bring it down into y glucis the, the GSS gene takes the glycine and this to make glutathione. So many people are aware of this. They even supplement with glutathione. And then glutathione will, through what's called glutathione conjugation, take out toxins, anything toxic in the body, particularly even things like mold. Well, after it does its job, it becomes oxidized down here. So that means it's given away its electron. Now we need NADPH to take this oxidized glutathione back to the reduced. So if we don't have enough NADPH, your oxidized glutathione doesn't just sit here. No, it does more. It combines with oxygen to make what's called superoxide. Then it combines with nitric oxide, which is a very important gas that we need for circulation. And it makes, oh no, peroxynitrite, uh, which is a very oxidizing agent that ironically will deplete your glutathione and start damaging your DNA. So that's why I'm such a fan of, of NADPH. Now, what can happen then is you can have mutations on this GSR enzyme. And this is a pattern that our research is showing continually. We just finished our ninth study on uh, Lyme's disease. And, uh, and perhaps when that's all finished, we can come back and talk about that. But the bottom line is it that there is more mutations in the GSR enzyme in those with chronic Lyme. I think we're going to find the same thing when we look at, uh, at uh, mycotoxin toxicity. But GSR is controlled by NERF2. And NERF2 is controlled by KEEP1. This is the 3D chess game played underwater, Joel. So, <laughs> so you can have mutations in KEEP1 that are too strong because what KEEP1 does, it holds on to NERF2 and releases it. So when you've got mutations in KEEP1, there are some mutations that make it stronger, hold on more tightly. Then if you've got mutations in NERF2 that make it weaker, then you've got mutations in GSR that make that weaker. And then if you have mutations that you don't make enough NADPH, like G6PD, and there's more that make NADPH, but G6PD makes your NADPH, you've got the proverbial perfect storm that this oxidized glutathione doesn't go back to reduce. Maybe a topic for another time would be talking about the ATOX1 enzyme. This is where we put copper onto SOD. And that just amplifies the problem. So here you can see that if we don't have enough NADPH, we're gonna have some serious problems taking this oxidized glutathione back to reduced. 
Now, I, was, I spoke, speak to a lot of functional medicine doctors, and many of them are saying, you know what, Bob? I am noticing that many in the functional medicine world used to give people glutathione with good results. They're having more and more times that they have bad results. So why would that be? Because you would tend to think, well, glutathione, the master antioxidant, neutralizes your peroxidases, takes out your toxins. How could that be bad for you? I've had many people said their, their health provider just yelled at them, you're just a hypochondriac, you must be making this up. You can't be responding poorly to glutathione. Well, if you don't take this oxidized glutathione back to the reduced, taking glutathione too quickly actually creates inflammation and reduces your glutathione. So what I'm teaching doctors now when they, when they do functional genomics is that you really got to look first, do you have trouble with KEEP1, NERF2, GSR, or NADPH, G6PD mutations being one of them, that you're not going to take your oxidized glutathione back to reduced. So you can have genetic issues that you don't make enough NAD and NADPH, um, but one of the things that we've been talking about for a long time is the, the phrase I've coined, and that's the NADPH steel. Uh, I am really intrigued by NADPH. And the reason I am is because NADPH, which comes from G6PD, is a cofactor for the NOS enzyme to make nitric oxide. This won a Nobel Prize for its relationship to circulation. It helps recycle uh, thriodoxin, which is another important antioxidant that clears the peroxidases. We spoke about glutathione. It also puts the, your, un, your older iron from heme into ferritin, turns your heme into biliverdin. It's needed to turn heme into carbon monoxide to stimulate NERF2. NADPH has a lot of roles, but this is what really fascinated me. And that is that NADPH does all these good things. However, there's a fascinating enzyme called NOx, NADPH oxidase fascinating enzyme. And this is part of our immune system. So what happens here is when we are faced with a pathogen, I mean, what a miracle the body is. When it sees a pathogen, it says, oops, you don't belong here. We need to take you out. This is kind of like our military. And it says, red alert, Houston, we got a problem. We got a foreign invader. We got to take somebody out. So it takes oxygen from iron, an electron from NADPH, makes superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, mast cells, histamine. The war is on, okay? The battle has begun. We're gonna take out this bad boy. And if we didn't have this, we'd die of infection. I mean, this is a critical part of who we are and how we protect ourselves. However, I believe what's happening is that many environmental factors that again, we weren't exposed to, 50 to 75 years ago, is overstimulating the NOx enzyme, overusing NADPH. Consequently, when we use it here, we don't have it for all of these good things. Now, I've not seen any literature on this, so let me just say this is the Bob Miller hypothesis, and that is there's incredible wisdom in the body. So we tend to think of free radicals as bad, antioxidants is good. For the most part, true. But we do need free radicals to fight those battles. So if we didn't have free radicals, we wouldn't survive. But the problem becomes when the free radicals become excessive. So I think we were designed that when the battle goes on, it would make total sense that you temporarily stop your antioxidant activity to allow the free radicals to do their thing. But if this is chronic, driven by environmental factors, this NADPH is used up. Now, talk about perfect storm. If you've got G6PD or other things that limit your NADPH, and you've got the NOx enzyme upregulated, these are the people that have chronic inflammation. They've got all kinds of histamine problems. They've got mast cell problems. You know, I find it interesting when I do seminars, uh, you know, I'll ask, how many of you doctors have taught more than 20 years? And I'll say, how many of you saw mast cell problems 20 years ago? And it's like, mm, we didn't see it. 
How many of you are seeing mast cell problems now? It's like, oh my gosh, so many people have mast cell activation syndrome. So these mast cells are our friends. You know, they are designed to fight the battle, but I believe environmental factors are overstimulating them. And that's why we're seeing so much adrenal fatigue because we need cortisol to knock down the histamine, which is made by your adrenals. So if you're constantly making all this histamine, you're gonna wear out your, I mean, there's many things on the adrenals, but this is one of the ways you can wear out your adrenals by desperately trying to fight this histamine battle. And I just see in my health coaching, probably 80% of the people I talk to have high histamine. And that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. And then if you have difficulty, it's beyond our scope today, but if you have difficulty with histamine and methyltransferase, the dynamine oxidase enzyme, glucuronidation, it gets uh, worse. And I think you'll find this chart fascinating. I don't know if you've seen this one, but if we don't clear our histamine, it'll stimulate interleukin-6, the cytokine, that stimulates the mast cells. And we've got a loop that just goes around here. And then the interleukin-6 makes more superoxide, makes more peroxynitrite. We need glutathione to deal with that. And if we've got G6P def deficiencies and we don't have enough NADPH, we don't have enough glutathione. Then what we've described as the home cycle is when superoxide, mast cells, and histamine stimulate the renin enzymes to make more angiotensin two, more interleukin six, and another merry-go-round that we're on here. And we just see this happening uh, so often. So um, if we look at a, uh, a chart here, I can actually show you where the, uh, where the G6PD is involved in making the, uh, the NADPH. So it's the pentose phosphate uh, pathway where glucose comes down with ATP, and then we make the, uh, the NADPH, and then that will support the, uh, the production. Uh, you also have the ME1 enzyme that makes NADPH, and uh, then you also have the de novo pathway where we make the, uh, the NAD, and we talked about that, how that supports PARP, uh, how that supports the sirtuins uh, that make many of your antioxidants, and then also another pathway down to, uh, to NADPH. So that's, uh, you know, why we need NADPH, and there's many other functions it's used for, and I believe that environmental factors are using it up, and then if someone has a genetic weakness, they're more prone to either less production or more of it uh, being used up. Yeah, so, so, you know, the whole thing I think about again was the intro of what you just mentioned in terms of the potentials and then looking at the pathways. If you can do me a quick favor, Bob, and just scroll it so you can see the whole diagram, like with everything that's involved in what you just described, so you can kind of bring up, okay, so how, how almost everything fits on the screen so you could see, yes. So here's all the pathways we're looking at, and ultimately we are working to understand how this is influencing people that are feeling awful. In this case with G6PD people, they're exhausted, they're tired, they have hemolytic events where their, their glutathione's depleted and their red blood cells burst and, and they get fatigued. But it's so, in my opinion, and again, Joel Rosen opinion, is it's so outdated in terms of, well, Looking at the diagram we just said and, and saying G6PD is one of the ways that makes the NADPH and glutathione protects uh, the, the um, red blood cells. And when glutathione is depleted, the NADPH doesn't come back around to help support the, the, repro the reprotection. But glutathione and NADPH involve the entire diagram you just showed. And so it, it brings us a whole new way of looking at how do we support this? How do we, because it's overwhelming if you look at it, it's like, okay, you'd said all that now, what do I do about it? How do I dial this down? So what I would ask you, Bob, is 
when you get these potentials and you see these pathways and you understand the NADPH steel and how the environment impacts that and what the what the 30,000 view foot impact would be on the individual that gets hit the hardest, which is pretty much going to be the same as they're tired, they're exhausted, they have no energy, they're not doing things they, they would love to be doing. What do you do about it with your with your coaching clients in terms of, okay, now is just a general question, Bob, in terms of how can we modulate this? How can we slow that home cycle down and NADPH cycle down? Sure. Well, one of my favorite sayings is we, we've got to get away from protocols and pill for the ill uh, because everyone's unique. So you could see 10 people in a row with similar conditions, but 10 different ways they got there. So that's one of my favorite things we've got to say that, you know, we don't look at the book, go, oh, this is my protocol that I do for that. Uh, I think we're going to look back on that as being naive and somewhat outdated. We've got to do things personally for the person. So I think one of the first steps is, um, you know, one of my, one of my favorite sayings is <clears throat> when the house is on fire, you don't paint the walls and mow the lawn. So one of the first places to look is, is there something upregulating the Knox enzyme? And that can be a little complex. Uh, it can be that you overabsorb iron. There's, uh, there's some individuals that have oxalates. In case anybody doesn't know, those are like little razor blades that are in some of the what are healthiest foods. Uh, when you look at spinach, kale, and beets, if you look at them under a microscope, they have little oxalates in them. They're sharp little things. So a lot of times people are not feeling well and they say, okay, I'm going to get my act together here. I'm going to eat healthy. And they start doing smoothies and they put spinach, kale, and beets in. And it's like, what the heck? I'm eating healthier and I'm feeling worse. <laughs> Hate when that happens, right? So if you've got a leaky gut, those oxalates can leak in. So doing like the Great Plains urine organic acid test can really help you understand whether you have oxalates. So for one person, it might be they need to stop their spinach, kale, and beet smoothies, which just seems so ironic. But that can be one of the factors. Uh, there are individuals who, particularly of English, Irish, Ashkenazi, Jewish background, have excess iron absorption. And that iron can drive the Knox enzyme. Uh, glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter that makes you intelligent, highly motivated, go-getter, uh, if it's in excess, it will drive the Knox enzyme. Uh, if you're a smoker, or particularly, a lot of my uh, my clients from California, when they had the fires, they were getting so sick with upregulated um, uh, mast cells because of the of the smoke. Aldosterone can do that. High homocysteine, uh, dopamine. So if somebody has um, clostridia, clostridia can impact the dopamine and norepinephrine conversion, and dopamine stimulates. For other people, it's uh, sulfites. So if they drink a glass of wine or they do, you know, high sulfur foods, they feel horrible. For other people, it's electromagnetic fields. So all of those things can drive that, including interleukin-6. And, uh, you know, maybe sometime we ought to consider doing a, uh, a webinar just on interleukin-6 because interleukin-6 drives the mast cells and the histamine. And look at all these things, mold and mycotoxins, Lyme disease, lipopolysaccharides, EMF and radon. By the way, everybody ought to check the radon in their house uh, and don't work next to your router. Uh, air pollution, smoking, sodium sulfate, the heavy metals, glyphosate, the omega-6s, VOCs. I mean, how many people do we know that uh, you know, a new car makes them sick. Uh, pesticides, anything that stimulates mTOR. Inside the body, histamine, dopamine, angiotensin II, the Knox enzyme, bradykinin, uh, obesity and hyperglycemia, high homocysteine, oxalates that we talked about, hydrogen peroxide, over-exercise. You can actually exercise too much. Interestingly, moderate exercise lowers IL-6, over-exercise increases it. I think you said this earlier that uh, everything you need to learn, you can learn with Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, 
and then virus and anxiety. So all of these will stimulate interleukin-6, mast cells, peroxynitrite, and then glutathione has to come to the rescue. And if we don't have enough NADPH, we're in trouble. So that's why NADPH is so important. And it's the NADPH, I don't have it on this chart, but it's the NADPH that helps the NOx enzyme stimulate all that inflammation. So it really is that proverbial 3D chess game played underwater here, Dr. Rosen. And, uh, and over on the right here, we have the things that, uh, that will lower it. But I am just seeing so many individuals have elevated interleukin-6. And of course, if you look at the, the published papers on COVID, uh, interleukin-6 is involved with, uh, you know, the serious cases of the cytokine storm. I'm sure we've all heard the story of the cytokine storm. <laughs> And that is um, elevated interleukin-6 that makes some of that lung inflammation. Another paper just came out in December that said that people who have IL-6, I'm sorry, NOx enzyme already upregulated are the ones who have more serious reactions to the, to the COVID. Because we know some people get COVID, they didn't even know they had it. Others have mild symptoms. Other people are gasping for breath and dying. So it's multifactorial and we don't want to oversimplify. But upregulation of NOx and IL-6 is a piece of what makes uh, COVID stronger. So that's part of the uh, three-day chess game we're uh, we're looking at here. Uh, and if you'd like, uh, would you would you like to talk a little bit about how fats impact this? Yeah, I, I definitely would. And I'm just going to say one comment, Bob, because it's all amazing information. But I, I know for some of the people, sometimes when I explain, so I that I work with and I talk to it's it's overwhelming right because it's they're not scientists and they as much as you're able to articulate this concept um, it, it's very complex information and if i'm exhausted and i'm tired and i have g6pd and i don't really know what it means and and i don't really understand what i could do about it and i just listen to this and it's very hard to understand i i think an easy way to summarize that is the environment stimulates an enzyme that helps your body deal with that environment and that creates free radicals and that makes your NADPH that much more uh, needed. And also at the same time, it's stimulating your glutathione production to clear out hydrogen peroxide. And I think that's the connection that they can come away with, Bob, because ultimately they know that a G6PD person knows and what Re Re uh, Becky is teaching in the group to the G6PD uh, deficiency support group in Facebook is that we need to preserve glutathione. And, and if we can preserve glutathione, and they understand that, uh, but as you said so delicately, if you take too much, it can feed a whole other pathway that creates more free radicals. So there should be an aha in their head thinking, oh, okay, well now I don't nest, I, I can support the environmental influences on my body that stimulate the depletion of glutathione and the need to have enough NADPH. And when NADPH isn't around, it's not gonna recycle the glutathione that is being used up. So that just kind of summarized that, but definitely wanna get now into your mitochondria information because I'm intrigued. Not only have I wrote down on my notes, like I'm a kid in the candy store every time I talk to you is I need that IL-6 pathway so that I can share that with other people because I don't have that. Oh, um, good that just like, yeah, I just let you know what a nerd I am, Bob, in terms of how excited I am to get that. But um, you were talking a little bit earlier about mitochondria and how you think this is the biggest impact that you've seen. And listen, when you say something like that to me, I know you've said that before about ACAT enzyme. Um, you've looked at FADS in the past, but you keep coming up with these new, I won't say shiny genes, but the more like look at me gene that this is a real big domino effect for all physiology in the body. Yeah, I believe this might be one of our biggest findings, but you bring a good point. I'm sure there's a pipe, some people that are glazing over at this point. So let me just give you some really quick things to do if you're dealing with this. Number one, make sure you're not being exposed to mold. Now, one of the things that we, I often say to people, do you think there's any mold in the house? Oh no, we, I don't, I don't see any mold here. We're, we're okay. Um, but as you know, yeah, by the way, thank you for participating in our, uh, in, in our seminar and uh, on mold. And, uh, you know, many people don't realize 
they can have a mold in the ductwork. Uh, it can just be coming from outside. There can be a leak that mold is up in the ceiling. Uh, it can be in the air conditioners. So uh, I hear that all the time. Nope, we don't have mold. And then we do a mold check and all of a sudden it's like, oh, we do have mold. Uh, you know, something really simple people can do. Uh, you can get a little Petri dish called mold armor. It's like eight or 10 bucks. And you just pour a liquid in there, let it gel, let it sit out for an hour, close it for two days. And if you see a lot of growth on there, then you better take mold seriously. Uh, there's different parts of the country that I've read on. I was stunned. I moved to a new office and, uh, and I was intrigued by mold, so I, or by uh, radon. So I got a little radon detector and oh my goodness, my new office had a radon of 13. Should be under two. So <laughs> it's like, oh, no. oops. <laughs> so wow. we had to get uh, radon mitigation. So, uh, and there's an interesting website, radon.com, where you can see average radon areas where you are. So if someone's not feeling well because of G6PD deficiency, as you said, there's things you can do to, uh, to bring that down. Get an air purifier, you know, uh, and in my office, I have three air purifiers uh, sitting in here. So, uh, and make sure you're drinking pure water. And uh, if you're smoking, stop smoking. Uh, just simple things. If you think it's a glyphosate issue, uh, start eating organic, you know, uh, start drinking hydrogen water. Um, it's amazing. Parsley is so helpful. Make sure your vitamin D levels are okay simple things that uh, that we can all do. But if I had to put at the top of the list, I'd have to say mold. Now, one of the things that I have observed, now, as, as you know, I'm, uh, I'm probably a little crazy. I do this nine to 11 hours a day, six days a week. And, uh, and I see some of the people that, you know, physicians bring people to me. It's like, Bob, we're stuck. I don't know what to do anymore. So a lot of my coaching is with physicians who've got people that are really ill and they just don't know what to do anymore. So we look at their genome and all of a sudden I started seeing a fascinating pattern. It's like, what the heck is going on here? They've got keep one stronger, nerf two weaker, possibly GSR not strong, G6PD or NQ01. By the way, NQ01 is another important enzyme that's involved with uh, making NADPH. And if you've got G6PD and NQ01, those can really pile up on you. So then I recognized that the oxidized glutathione is not turning back to the reduced. But I noticed something else. And all of a sudden it was like, I keep seeing this time after time. There's an enzyme called fatty acid desaturase and or fads. And what it does, it takes our fats from our, uh, from our diet and turns them into the EPA, DHA, and then something called protectins and resolvins, which are anti-inflammatory. If they don't go down this pathway properly, they will turn into arachidonic acid. And then an interesting collision occurs. The oxidized glutathione combines with the free fatty acids, and there's an enzyme called 12-lipooxygenase that makes 12 HPD and 12 HEDI, names don't matter. But bottom line is, it creates mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress. I'm saying publicly, I think this is a smoking gun that nobody's been looking at. Uh, I just see it continually. It'll even affect the, uh, the eyelid function of the pancreas. So we have to wonder, is this impacting, now this is just hypothetical, is this impacting uh, pancreatic enzymes? So some of the research we're doing is how people who have this, how they do on pancreatic enzymes or uh, lipase, uh, amylase, and protease to see if we can digest those fats uh, better. And then also there are some supplements that are actually the SPMs that are already down, uh, down the pathway here at the, uh, at the protectins and resolvents. Now this ALOX enzyme, Look what this guy does. It stimulates the NOx enzyme. It stimulates tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. It weakens autophagy. Whoa. So this, my friend, I think is a big deal. And stay tuned for more on this uh, because I think this might be the smoking gun behind individuals who are struggling. 
Uh, and look what we need to clear this HPD, glutathione peroxidase, another strain on your glutathione. Oops. And we can talk about this on another time, but the superoxide dismutase we spoke about needs an electron from glutathione to recycle that. So if you remember, if we don't take our oxidized glutathione back to our reduced, we make more superoxide. And even if we've got good atox one genes or plenty of copper, if we don't have enough glutathione, you don't recycle this guy. So it's like having a brand new car with no gas. So in case anybody's really confused by now, what I'm talking about here is that if you don't have enough NADPH and your oxidized glutathione doesn't go back to the reduced, and you don't have enough superoxide dismutase, that's when you really do the damage to the body. So stay tuned on that. Uh, perhaps when we have more of that data together, we wanna do a follow-up because we're in a research stage on that. But for any of the doctors who are watching this, uh, when you see anything that inhibits your oxidized or reduced glutathione, inhibits that, and you got fads, these people are just, the folks can't get out of bed, they're intense pain, they're going one clinic to another. Nobody's figuring out what's going on. And, uh, and that's the, uh, that's the merry-go-round they're on. Now, I think you would ask about, you know, what do we do for this stuff? And I think we, we kind of went down another bunny trail. My general approach is first, if NOx is upregulated, you got to get NOx calm down. Then if we've got problems with NERF2 and KEEP1 and GSR, we got to do this. Now, even if you have an NADPH deficiency, there's a nutrient called nicotinamide mononucleotide that supports the production of NADPH. So it isn't just a, I've got G6PD, I'm in trouble, I guess I'm going to be sick the rest of my life. There's things you can do. You can take the strain off the glutathione so that you don't have to use as much. You can try to reduce oxidative stress. You can look at things like catalase to clear hydrogen peroxide so glutathione doesn't have to do the job but it is that 3D chess game played underwater. Again, amazing stuff, Bob. And it really does sum up in terms of the pathways that you develop to be able to make these potentials. And then as deep in the weeds as you're getting to understand how it all fits together and, and creates havoc in the body, Ultimately, if we can help this phase of the cycle to get back up and around to be able to uh, continually replenish itself, we'll see in general so many health conditions to be able to be improved by that. It's just now it's the work is in, in doing that so that everything else supports that happening as well too. But one of the thing I want Becky to say, which was a really good point to what you said earlier with the FADS, how that comes back around and helps with the ability of the glutathione with the NADPH to get back up with the group that she runs, the G6PD, that she's noticed that with most or the research as well, that the hemolysis and the breaking of those red blood cells um, are, are shown with the studies um, to upregulate arachidonic acid. So but Becky, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you found and how that relates to what Bob says and specifically as we are trying to, from a G6PD point of view, come up with a dietary approach that can harness and be in, as Bob says, everything you needed to learn was through Goldilocks and the three bears, be in the Goldilocks zone there of not too much fat, not too little, but give us a little more implications of that finding. Um, well, as you know, with G6PD, we're very, uh, people are very vulnerable to um, reactive oxygen species. And the arachidonic acid increases that Absolutely. But I've also read specifically that um, in the G6PD deficient cells, they are finding a high proportion of the arachidonic acid and lower proportions of palmitic and stearic acid. So I found that to be really interesting, um, especially when you look at what parts of the world experience G6PD deficiency in a, in a high quantity, which is, which can be the Mediterranean. So, um, some of these 
uh, you know, some of these um, genetic things are protective in a way. And if you're following the traditional diet where, you know, where this came about, you might be protected as well. So uh, we have some people from Greece in the group with their G6PD deficient and they have no symptoms. So, you know, we can look at maybe their lifestyle is a lot better than it is in the U S hopefully, but also maybe they're following a different type of diet where they're getting more of that palmitic steric oleic acid, and they're not getting those, you know, that, that harmful rise of the arachidonic acid in their cells. It's, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. I'd be interested to know too, Bob, Becky and I had talked about this in terms of seeing the differences because we do have cohorts of the, the, um, some Filipino areas and African areas and Mediterranean areas and seeing now which percentage of those people that get hit the hardest along with their diet happen to have those FAD genes and they're not even getting the Mediterranean thing. I would imagine that the Mediterranean, if they do have the FADS, at least they're getting more to be able to, to break down from that versus if you also have that FADS and you live in a country that you don't eat a lot of fat, it's gonna be even more potentially problematic, but it'd be interesting for research information in, in that way to be able to see those connections. Um, oh, no as, as far, yeah, yeah. So as far as the, the one thing that, you know, I am a, I'm grateful for your time, but I think it's really important for you to kind of give us out your impression of and, and the understanding of that you alluded to it earlier in terms of mTOR and autophagy and how important that is. I mean, that's a whole other seminar, but, but as far as how, what is that? And why, sh why is that really important in everything we've just talked about? Sure. Well, let's talk about mTOR, the growth of new cells. And maybe while I'm chatting here, I can uh, pull up a slide here. So mTOR is the growth of new cells. And if we didn't have mTOR, life wouldn't exist uh, because the sperm and the egg would never become the baby. The baby would never become uh, the adult. Here's my slide. There we go. Let me do a screen share. There we go. So here's my uh, my mTOR slide, and this was a 2018 uh, presentation at uh, the Lyme conference in uh, in Boston, and we actually found that uh, those with chronic Lyme had more predispositions uh, to an uh, imbalance between mTOR and autophagy. So mTOR is the growth of new cells, and again, that is like a copy machine that causes things to happen. Autophagy is the cleaning of the cells. So as you know, your cells are constantly dividing. And uh, the old cell, when it dies, it needs to be cleaned out. It needs to be reabsorbed, uh, something called uh, autophagosomes that do that. And then they expel the waste through the excretion. And if that doesn't happen, a good telltale sign of that is when you get age spots prematurely. Uh, age spots, sunspots, liver spots is when the cells aren't being excreted, they become sentient. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you see people in their mid to late 50s being filled with age spots. You know, it should be happening to us if at all in our 80s. Uh, so that's a sign that the autophagy is not uh, working. So mTOR uh, is a replication of cells, and it doesn't care whether it's a healthy cell, cancer cell, or COVID. It replicates it. And if you look at the chart here, you'll see xenoestrogens, plastics. Some people are doing too many amino acids and hormones. I get very concerned when people take the growth factor hormones. Uh, Glucose and insulin that can also be driven by EMF, too much iron, uh, too much glutamate. And I think too many people are taking uh, glutamine for their for their leaky guts and, uh, you know, causing extra glutamate and folate. Now, we know pregnant women, they need to be on folate because if they've got particular mutations that they don't have enough folate, they can either not get pregnant, have a miscarriage or deformed baby. So they need the folate to stimulate that mTOR. But right now, particularly with the environment we're living in now, I get a little concerned that some people who are not pregnant might be overtaking too much methylfolate, driving mTOR too strongly. <coughs> so mTOR will inhibit autophagy. So that's why we're seeing such a, an increase in popularity of intermittent fasting. Because when you stop the calories, I give the analogy, this is like the construction crew and you take away the building materials. 
So when you take away the building materials, it's like, okay, guys, break time. Janitors, come out and do your job. So I believe multiple environmental factors is pushing mTOR versus autophagy. You know, and one of the things we're doing, I think we're going to look back someday, and what were we thinking? Giving our animals growth hormones so they get fatter faster. Oh, my. We're going to look back on that and say, oops. You know, but for people my own age, we often talk about, you know, when I was 12, girls looked like flat-chested little girls. Now 12-year-olds look like 18-year-olds because we're driving the growth hormones. And we don't have no idea what the long-term ramifications of that is as far as cancers and other things. So that's why intermittent fasting and ketogenic diet has been so helpful. But what's interesting, people who have a lot of mutations on the FADs or the PEMT, they crash on the, on the ketogenic diet. They, they can't handle it. They need carbohydrates on a, on a regular basis. So an mTOR stimulates interleukin-6 which then stimulates mast cells, histamine, superoxide, peroxynitrite, depleting your glutathione. Oops. Yeah, and one of them you, for, I mean, you did mention, but I mean, it, it's that it's just there all the time is the EMF, whole other story, but that EMF drives that up and insulin up and mTOR up. One of the other things I would say is on that mTOR diagram, it does stimulate that pentose phosphate pathway that causes that, um, that makes the NADPH and depletes the G6PD even further. So mTOR is really important G6PD people to, to know how to regulate. And Bob, I don't even think of it anymore as the crew ever stops working. They don't go on breaks. They don't, right. and you really, if you can at least s slow the momentum, I don't even think you put it on pause, let alone off. I don't ever think you do. I think it's yeah. past that point. But if you can do uh, fasting mimicking diets and other things that will help berberine and things that can stimulate AMPK, there's so many things that can be done about that, which is why we do the information we're doing. But ultimately, to, to your point, though, you, everything in balance, because if that mTOR is not being stimulated, it's not making the NADPH either. So at the same time, we need to really learn how to balance this. But your information is always amazing. And I, I'm, again, just thank you for everything you do, because it, 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 I think you are humble in the way that you say potential so that uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but we understand the depth of these pathways and you're deep in the woods and uh, really impacting the way healthcare is being practiced. And ultimately you have successes and that's the thing. The sky is not falling. We, we have the ability to harness what we know information wise and Bob, you're a living testament to that. You just said six days a week, 11, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and your brain is still really sharp and amazing. So thank you for everything you do. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, ultimately there are a lot of providers listening to this and you did mention about your conferences. I'd be curious to know if you're having any live ones coming up because I'd love to be at your next one live. Um, but ultimately, how do how does it work if I'm a provider? And I, I had a lot of aha moments in this call. And how do I learn more? Sure. Uh, we decided we were going to wait until we can know if we're going to have a live conference. So we may just push it off to spring of, uh, of next year. Virtual okay. is fine, but it's... Uh, as one doctor said, it's it's so nice to see each other's naked faces live. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, right. So we're it's we're true. going to uh, see if we can have a live conference uh, in the spring of 2022. Uh, but if somebody wants to learn about our online certification courses, just go to functionalgenomicanalysis.com, functionalgenomicanalysis.com, and right there you can go into my online certification course. Now this is for physicians or other health professionals, and uh, the first couple of modules are free. And, uh, and then, of course, we have our own genetic test. We have our own spit kit. We have our own online software. We've put about $2.5 million into the development. Uh, we're continuing to roll out advances. So we, we want to be of a help to the health professional. So we have medical doctors. We have chiropractors. We have uh, traditional, we have naturopaths who do this work. And uh, if someone's a health professional listening to this, um, I want to just say that the reports we make are not for the faint of heart. If somebody thinks they're going to get a two-page report that says do this, 
uh, no, <laughs> you, you've got to do your homework. Uh, you got to learn the pathways. And uh, but the software does give you suggestions as to, uh, you know, where you need help. And we're putting uh, in uh, what are called dynamic messages in all the time so that uh, there's actually going to be messages that will come up from me that will be like, you know what? You've got NQ01 and G6PD, but you also have NRF2. So I don't think we spoke about that, but NRF2 controls G6PD and NQ01. So, you know, that's why I think some people might be able to have G6PD and they're fine. Other people are more impacted. So if you've got the G6PD weakness in NRF2, upregulation and keep one, then those G6PDs might be a whole lot more important. So again, we, we like to simplify things. Gene, problem. I think we're going to have to abandon that someday and see that it's that 3D chess game played underwater, multiple SNPs, multiple environmental factors. And so if you've got G6PD and you live in mold and you're a smoker and you're under chronic stress and you just got an over Lyme disease, uh, you're going to be a whole lot harder than the person who doesn't do that, eats organically, meditates or does whatever for stress. So there's, there's multiple factors. And I think we're going to find there aren't simple solutions. That's the beauty of it all. As complex as this gets, the simple solution is the common sense solution and the, you know, what, what you should be doing anyways. And so just to, just to thank you once again, and to echo the fact that when you have the the, the gene snips, it's, it's a very reductionistic approach as you've listened from, from this going forward. Uh, it's interesting f f as well, Bob, because I, I listened to some of our old talks and it, I, you've mentioned like, I think someday we'll look back and think that was naive of us as the doctor, yes. right? And, and I think that you continue to grow that knowledge base to be able to understand and give hope and provide solutions. So, and, it, and it, there are effective solutions. So if you're a provider listening to that, I, I highly recommend that because as you mentioned last in, pat, in, in finalizing is we, you now work mostly with doctors that are not knowing what to do at this point because it is so complex. So when you open up that blueprint of the, of the functional genomic analysis and you see all those things, you have these light bulbs saying, hey, look here, look here. And, and you're now doing research studies over time to see these correlations. And it's not just the other, what you just mentioned, they're hit harder with ATOX now, that would make it worse and FADS. So now you can put in your software, hey, as soon as ATOX comes up and it goes down the superoxide pathway, let's let them know that that's something we need to consider too. So that's awesome information, Bob. Really, really great. Thank you so much for, for spending the time and helping people with G6PD get some more information and ultimately empower them to be able to know that it's not a gavel of the ground in granite, that this is a problem for you forever. You are empowered to be able to do something about it. Absolutely. Well, it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it like always and uh, glad to come back anytime you want me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bob.